Hey, I'm, I'm David Domke. I'm chair of the Department of Communication. And I, we wanted to institute a podcast series where I talk with faculty or staff about initiatives that we're doing in the department. I want to do the first one um, today by focusing on a, a course that we're offering online. It's called a Massive Open Online Course. And this is a brand new thing. It's crazy. And so I want to talk a little bit about it and just have some fun by interviewing Matt McGarity, the, uh, the faculty member who's taken on this this uh, creation, this monstrous entity. So we're going to have some fun, but also be serious because this is a really important development for the department and for the university. So Matt, thanks for taking a couple minutes. Oh, happy to do it. Actually, I, I, I talk a lot about MOOCs. I enjoy talking about MOOCs. Uh, and so I can just sort of walk through the course. So. Yeah, what is a MOOC, first of all? All right, so MOOC, which is a horrible acronym, that's an acrostic if it actually spells a word, uh, is a massive open online course. So um, there's been online education for a number of years, right? Um, online education in many ways emerges from distance learning. Okay, so here at the UW, we've been doing online education for a while, but these are traditionally sized classes, so probably 30, 40 students, and a single instructor. And uh, what is happening with MOOCs, and there are, are multiple uh, platforms that provide MOOCs, is they just are global in scope and they're free. So anyone can sign up uh, and anyone can take one of these courses. And so uh, these have massive numbers and uh, you know, it is a massive open online course. So um, you look at uh, one of the major platforms that I'm working on is Coursera. Coursera has actually only been around for slightly over a year. Okay. So let's go back to this online enrollment. How big are these numbers we're talking about here? Okay, so... A couple hundred? <laughs> uh, not at all. Um, so they vary, and I think it probably varies based on the nature of the class. Uh, some classes naturally scale bigger than others. Price, uh, there's a lot of STEM ones, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Math classes typically go fairly large. My class, for example, it, we get about 1,000 enrollments a day. Uh, and the course hadn't started yet. So the course starts in about two and a half weeks, and we're at about 40,000 enrollments today. Um, and so by the time the course starts, it'll probably be 50 or 60,000. And then enrollment doesn't stop because it's, it's online. So it's not synchronous, it's asynchronous. So people can jump in whenever. So it'll probably go for, enrollment goes for another month. So the high watermark of enrollments, I have no idea. Is this, uh, so it's free? It is free. So I can do it, anybody can do it? Anybody can do it. Okay, your, your child, your children can do this? They, they can. They are five and two years old, so I don't <laughs> think they would gain much out of it, but... Uh, You're selling but, yourself short. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they don't listen to me when I'm live right there in person at the dinner table. I don't know if they would listen to me uh, through a television screen or a computer okay. screen. So, uh, what, what, you know, give us one reason, just one reason why you want to do this. Uh, gosh, one reason. That's, that's tough. I would say uh, m my main reason for doing it, and, you know, it has been a massive amount of work, but I wouldn't change my mind. If I could go back in time, I would, ex I would make the exact same choice. I would tell myself, give, give, give myself a little bit more time. But the, the main reason I did it was it's just a, it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, it, it, you know, I like teaching large lectures here, but I'm looking at 200 students that are bound by this locale. This, this class, I mean, tens of thousands from around the world. That's, a, that's an amazing opportunity. And I come to this, I would say, I come to this MOOC more as an advocate for my material. This is a public speaking class. Uh, I come to it as an advocate for the material more than I am an advocate for the platform, for online learning. I think online learning is great, but I'm not doing it because I'm, an, I, 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 I'm passionate for online learning. I'm passionate for my material, and this is another way of doing that type of outreach. So I, I just believe very strongly in the way in which, not only in people having public speaking skills, people are hungry for these, but being able to provide something that gives more than just tips and tricks. More than just, you know, imagine the audience naked or in their underwear, I suppose is the, how it goes. Either one, it's... Well, that, that, kind of, that brings yeah. up one thing, that, that analogy, that, that story, this idea that you should imagine the audience in their underwear. That might not fly if you're teaching somebody who's from West Africa or something, <laughs> right? Exactly. So you got to really think through how you're, because you're no longer talking to 40 or 200 people sitting in a University of Washington classroom, right? Exactly. One of the, the, the biggest changes, the thing that's taken perhaps most of my time, is moving through my course material in terms of does this scale globally? 
does this example that I'm giving, does this, is this accessible mm. for someone from Belize and from, you know, Moscow? And, and so that's the real challenge. <laughs> and of course, public speaking is so culturally and socially encoded. And so at the beginning of this MOOC class, I've got a number of modules where I'm saying basically, we're coming at this from skills, not from genres. And these skills, you are going to have to apply and adapt to whatever your speaking genre is. So I, you know, I can't teach to a, a narrow form of this is what a business presentation looks like because business presentations look differently uh, in, in different parts of the world. So finding that right balance between usable, a usable skill set, uh, but at the same time not overly limited or overly westernized uh, is, has been the primary challenge. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me, let's do a couple uh, word, word, word games here where I'll, I'll tell you a topic and you just give me a word or two. Okay. okay? So just a word or two. Um, if I'm the average person uh, out in the general public thinking about delivering a public speech, what's a word or two that probably is in my mind? Uh, fear. Okay, fear. Uh, what's, the, what's, the word that's, what's a word in your mind when you try to teach me about it? Um, natural. Natural? I should be natural? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. You know, in many ways, a lot of the fear of public speaking emerges out of, and this is one of the things we cover in the course, an approach to public speaking that views it as a, a, a stage production, a performance, something that's set and written and, and, and has to be delivered in a very performative way. A lot of the time, that only amplifies any nerves people have. So typically what I want to do is come in and say, I can help you organize your presentation, I can help you structure it, I can help you practice it, and, and but for the most part, I really want you to tap into sort of your innate ability to converse naturally. As human beings, we, we speak uh, in the same way that birds fly. It's what we do. Uh, there's nothing <laughs> wildly, um, you know, we're not going to find dogs delivering presentations to one another, but this, this conversational speech is the norm and everything else is a derivation. Right. So the Virginia, uh, Virginia Lieutenant Governor nominee for the Republican Party just said today that he doesn't believe in evolution because monkeys can't talk. So your argument is that, that <laughs> you're saying that this is one of the pieces that makes us human, right? Yeah, it, well, yes. Uh, so yes. No, no Boy, there's so, there's so much <laughs> to respond to in that. Uh, and, of course, apes don't talk, but we have perfect evidence that they are able to use to communicate, to communicate via, via right. sign language, and, uh, and then, of course, that monkey. Anyway, so next, leaving next, aside all the issues. Next that, word so. association. So uh, what's the average person in the public think about when they hear online education? Oh, I don't know if they have a thought, to be quite honest. Um, I, I think like at home. I think kind of like oh, oh, oh. so like they're at home. They're like I don't have to go anywhere. I don't yeah. have to go to school, right? Yeah. yeah, I you know of course as we you know increasingly what we see now is and some of the early research and I mean this sort of massive on, open online stuff is so new, uh, but some of the research indicates that a lot of them are accessing it not at home. Oh. Right? I mean we've got so many mobile platforms. If you've broken up a lecture into an eight to ten minute chunk. There's no reason why you're not watching it on the bus. Yeah. There's no reason why you're not, you know, doing, you know, tuning into something on the bus uh, if you're in Seattle, or on the ferry, or on the camel, or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I mean, you know, the thing is, it, the 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 model uh, has sort of the, the model that emerges when it comes to online education is people, you know, uh, as teachers, one of the things we want to be able to do is sort of envision what the life cycle is for a student with our material in our course. So I know where you are when you're in the class, but then I want to be able to think about, well, how are you spending your time with the work when I don't see you? And, and for online education, in some cases, that, that assumption has been, you know, the person sitting at their computer, pen at the ready, writing notes. A and what we're starting to see is, no, it's not like that at all. The, the second you give out that content, the second you cut your, you sever your tie to a physical classroom location, there's no reason it has to be done in any one given spot. Now, in general, but so what you're saying in essence is, though is it's not in a classroom, it's at home, it's on your own time. Yeah. And so it is, it's very self-paced, but that changes how you construct a course uh, so that someone, you want to provide enough guidance so that they can self-pace and that they can engage in the material, but you don't want to overly structure that experience so that it's limiting uh, and, and doesn't fit somebody's schedule. So uh, what's, the, what's an average faculty member think of when they think of online education? 
Ah, oh, boy, you know, the, the, I don't think there's one average response. I think there is, on the one hand, uh, faculty members who love it and say this is what a public university should be doing as a matter of its educational outreach. And then you have some who say this endangers what, uh, what universities are about. Uh, and and it depends on who you talk to, and it depends on how you're talking about what online education is. Does it offer degrees? Does it not? Um, so I think I think there's a varied response among faculty. Um, but being able to unite those two is probably what UW and what we are all interested in. How can we sort of advance the mission of the university without hurting the university? Okay. So what, what was, what's the tipping point for you to do this? Is it, is it the access, so many people to provide to them, the opportunity to reach them? Yeah, it, it really is. I'm often asked to do workshops. Okay, so I, I teach public speaking classes, but I'm often asked to do workshops around town, you know, uh, at the university, outside the university. And I view this as kind of, of just a, a bigger workshop. Okay? It, it's not the same as a, the class that I teach here. It, it cannot be. Uh, they're watching it online. It's a public speaking class and they don't have a physical audience in many cases. But um, it's, it's just uh, an opportunity to sort of expand that. Uh, I, I profoundly believe in the ability of public speaking to make people's lives better and careers better. That is a fundamental uh, uh, you know, conceit I make. And so this is just a, you know, an unprecedented opportunity to, to reach a massive audience. Okay, to the CEO at Starbucks, why should they take this class? Uh, to, the, to the CEO of Starbucks? Because he wants to fund it. No, uh, <laughs> uh, because the, the skills that we're working at uh, are about clarity. So I mean, there's a way, there's a thousand ways you could run a public speaking course. This course is about clarity in presentations. And, and in that sense, the CEO of Starbucks needs the course in order to make clearer to his uh, investors, to his public, what Starbucks is doing that is that is good for the community, or how uh, uh, you know recent challenges to Starbucks or other Starbucks-funded initiatives uh, responding to it, but being clear and, and evidence-driven. Okay. I want to hear your claims, and I want to hear how and why your claims are supported by the evidence that you have. Okay. To the 33-year-old mother of two in um, uh, Saint Petersburg, Russia. Why should she take this class? Well, I know some, you know, some, some 33-year-old mothers of two in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, but, uh, or at least I did at one point. So why, why would that person engage in this? Well, uh, certainly they're not talking to, you know, the investors of Starbucks. But without a doubt, they're going to want to be able to organize their thoughts quickly and express them in an articulate way. Um, now, of course, they're speaking in Russian. What I'm talking about is in English. Uh, but the, the, the same basic skill set and the emphases is going to translate. And so it's, it's certainly something if they want to go into a career, right, um, employers prioritize uh, communication skills above all others. And um, we've seen this recently in recent, you know, uh, university and uh, professional uh, surveys. Is that what, that's what they're looking for. Hmm. But then any time that you're engaged in some sort of even non-professional civic realm, right, being able to clearly express yourself, uh, is at place at a premium. At the very minimum, everyone's going to have to deliver some type of presentation at some point in their life. Better for it to be good and for them to be less apprehensive than for it to be bad and them scared. So. Okay, so what, uh, what, what's the word that comes to mind for you right now in the midst of creating this class? What's the word that comes to mind about this class? About the class or about preparing it? Well, I think maybe preparing it. About preparing it. Okay, gonna take us behind the veil a little bit of yeah. you. The key word in preparing it. Challenge. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. I've got multiple challenges. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but it is trying to develop something that works in its medium. So it's not simply taking a class that I taught for 200 students in a live setting and putting it online. That, that just violates the very notion of what this should be. It is taking the core concepts and then refiguring them in an online space. So it's, it's different mediums. It's adapting a, you know, a book into a, into a movie. And to, the, and to the critique that exists that, that these students are they're never going to talk to you, they're never going to interact with you, they're just going to be watching a video of Matt McGarity um, 
And well, that's not really, that's not education. That's, that's watching a YouTube video. <laughs> what do you respond to that critique? Well, you know, certainly the, the one, I've got multiple responses to that. One of them would be uh, when they're watching me lecture, they're just watching a, you know, uh, they're watching me talk then. Uh, but there I've got interactive, I've got ways of interacting with them and more importantly, getting them to interact with themselves. Well, we've got all that online. Uh, we've got ways for them to sort of create self-sustaining learning communities and interact with one another online. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, they can always pose a question to me, and, uh, but it is, it is different. And, and I think in some ways that the course metaphor for talking about online education, it, it, sometimes it doesn't fit that metaphor. It is a different thing. Uh, and if it is held up to the standard of, uh, well, you know, face-to-face -face interaction is better than just watching a YouTube video. Well, that's apples and oranges. Again, I go back to that translation model, which is, it's like someone saying, well, the book was better than the movie. Well, the book and the movie are separate things. Uh, and they're doing separate things. Uh, and, and so the, it is much better to sort of evaluate one against the criteria that it should be evaluated against. Okay. And so in that case, online education would be, is this accessible? All right, so just to wrap it up here, what's, a, what's, a, what's the goal What's the, the takeaway that you want people to be able to do at the end of this course? My goal is because so many people are coming to it from so many different places and with their own motivations. Um, my goal would be merely that everyone who signs up gets something out of it. And, and there are going to be people who merely watch the videos. And if that's what is doing something for them, if they get something out of that, great. Uh, there are going to be some people who participate actively in the discussion forums and post videos of their speech assignments. They're going to get something different out of it. Uh, but I just want everyone who takes the course to get some ideas about public speaking, get a little bit better at public speaking, or get a lot bit, uh, better at public speaking. So my goals are more that I provide a resource that is useful for a huge number of people. Has anybody ever taught a public speaking course online like this? Oh, they've taught public speaking courses online. They've never taught one this size. This is without a doubt is the first. Hmm. So the cool thing is, here's another motivation for doing it. So this starts on June 24th. Okay. So on June 24th, I will be able to claim at least three things. <laughs> and on June 25th, I might be able to claim one more. On June 24th, uh, I will be the instructor uh, of the single largest public speaking course in the world. <laughs> in the history of the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, and therefore, at that, at that shining moment, I will be perhaps the, the, the most recognized living teacher of public speaking. Those are, that's June 24th. June 25th, I might very well be the most reviled. <laughs> um, so so it's, it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, and uh, and there are, there's a great honor in being first. And there's also a great danger in being first. Well, by my calculation, we've been talking for about 15 minutes. So in that span of time, I'm guessing, uh, doing, my, doing the math, in that span of time, we've had at least 10 to 15 people sign up for this class, <laughs> okay? Uh, on the basis of the calculation of 1,000 a day, yeah, yeah. right? So, well, thanks a lot, Matt. I well, really thanks. appreciate it. Yeah. I enjoyed, I enjoyed yeah. chatting about it. Yeah. Thank you. That's our first podcast conversations with the chair in the Department of Communication. We have so many interesting things going on here that we're just going to do a number of these periodically, make available in audio and video format. We'll come back and talk to Matt maybe halfway through this class and just see how reviled he is exactly. So thank you very much for joining us.